Welcome to Restoration. I'm Rabbi Matt. So glad you could join us on this uh, for this online Shabbat. So glad that you could join us. If you're watching on the Restoration app or ShalomSeal.com or on YouTube, however you connect with us, we're glad that you're here. If you have uh, the if you have not downloaded the Restoration app, we encourage you to do that. Turn on notifications. I promise we won't spam you, but we'll send you some notifications of messages and things that are happening here at restoration and i'm so excited to see so many people uh buying my book jesus never said anything new um it's been a really exciting time receiving all kinds of uh dms and text messages and facebook messages and um so many people uh that i've known from all different parts of my life um who have bought the book and connected with the book and reviewed the book um, I'm just really grateful. And we're continuing our series today uh, with the same title as the book, Jesus Never Said Anything New, which is available on Amazon right now in paperback and Kindle. Um, and if you're connecting with us from somewhere else, but you're blessed by these messages and you'd like to give, you can do that on our Restoration app or ShalomSeattle.com. And those who are members and regular attenders, uh, know that that's how we give for our tithes and offerings. So today we're going to talk about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, as the fourth part of the series, Jesus Never Said Anything New. And really, the, the issue is to make Jesus anything but Jewish is to colonize him. It's what I've called in years past the colonization of Jesus. It's colonization is stripping uh, one's culture and remaking them into your image or your culture. And, and this happens to Jesus all the time. He, his Jewishness has been stripped away and, and just about every other culture in the world has been giving, given to him instead. Uh, and, and the reason is because people want to connect with him as a representative representative of their culture. So you find white Jesus and black Jesus and Mongolian Jesus and Mexican Jesus and Jamaican Jesus and Ethiopian Jesus. He's everywhere. And there's different uh, versions of him everywhere. And the intent of people, I think, is honest attempt to relate to Jesus by making him one of them. This is why understanding Jesus and his Jewishness is so important for every follower of Jesus. Because the truth is, you can't understand him his words, or his mission, if you separate him from his Jewishness. David Stern, one of my theological heroes, said in his book, Restoring the Jewishness of the Gospel, that we're not actually preaching the whole gospel if part of the story does not include the Jewishness of Jesus and his Jewish practice. He went to synagogue on Saturdays. He lived in Israel and spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. He celebrated Passover and Shavuot and Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot and Hanukkah and Purim. He read the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. He called 12 Jewish men to follow him. They called him rabbi. He ate only clean food, according to Leviticus. He prayed in the temple as he spoke about our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to make him out to be anything else misses this crucial piece of who Jesus is. He is a Jewish person who came to save his people and call us, Israel, the Jewish people, to tell the nation that there's only one God and that he is the only visible image of God in the person of Yeshua. If you followed us for any amount of time or, or been a part of our community, you know the reason why restoration exists is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. We have six core values, and the first of our six core values is that we are messianic, which means we reflect the Jewishness of Yeshua. Messianic is similar to the word Christian, where Christian means follower of Christ. Messianic means follower of Messiah, and we say often at Restoration, that Messianic Judaism is not Judaism plus Jesus or Jesus plus Judaism. Messianic Judaism is the Judaism of Jesus. It's, it's an attempt to follow the, the, the commandments and keep the commandments the way our rabbi, Jesus, Yeshua, told us to. And your identity matters. Whether you're Jewish or, or a Gentile from the nations, your identity matters as a reflection of the Jewishness of Yeshua. 
See, the, I've said in the first message of this series, the Jewishness of Jesus, is his practice of Judaism is a part of who he is. And the more we can go back to understand Jewish context, the deeper our relationship, whether we're Jewish or Gentile, the deeper your relationship with Yeshua will go. And we live in this amazing day where Christians, at the same time as Jewish people, are recognizing Yeshua in his Jewish context. And we're seeing the fullness of the Gentiles come to pass. I, I had the joy of, uh, of preaching a sermon in, in a series for, for my friend, Pastor Preston Morrison at Gateway Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. But he's doing a whole three-month series from the beginning of January through Easter at their church called Real Jesus, where they're exploring the Jewishness of Jesus. And, and these kind of things just haven't happened before for the longest time, at least back to the times of the original Jewish followers of Yeshua. And I got to preach one of those messages there at Gateway Church, and, and, and my friend Rabbi Troy Wallace preached, is preaching two of the messages, but more amazing than Messianic rabbis preaching the Jewishness of Jesus are Gentile pastors like Preston Morrison and, and, and our friend Tim Ross and at Embassy City Church, who are preaching the Jewishness of Jesus to mostly Gentile audiences. And we say often, this, this doesn't mean, understanding the Jewishness of Jesus doesn't mean that we're trying to convince everybody to become Jews, or, or to keep Shabbat, or to keep the holidays, or to keep kosher. We are not advocating here at Restoration that Gentiles should keep kosher, the holy day, Shabbat, or begin circumcising their sons especially their adult sons. <laughs> but we are, what we are advocating is that there's room for Jewish people who follow Yeshua by practicing the Judaism that he practiced with him as our rabbi. And there's, and there's room for uh, Gentiles who, who understand the Jewishness of Jesus but don't practice Messianic Judaism. And there's room for Gentiles who, who want to practice some of the things that Jesus practiced and understand uh, 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 by doing those things. You know, it took us, I was talking to my dad this week, and, and many of you know my, my dad's a Messianic rabbi in New York, and, and we were talking about the days that, the, when, when he first uh, became a follower of Yeshua and, and started wearing a kippah and, and the way people would respond to him. And he, and he told me this story uh, of uh, he was selling fitness equipment to all these different fitness places all over the New York uh, tri-state area and he was uh, you know somebody asked him a question and the people who were in charge of this one facility were Christians and they said oh you got to talk to this guy he's Jewish also and the Jewish guy uh, also a believer in Jesus came and talked to my dad and and the Jewish person said to my dad you know why are you wearing what you're wearing and my dad said well I'm, I'm an observant Messianic Jew which means I keep Judaism and practice you know, keep Shabbat and practice these things. And this fellow Jewish person who believed that he had converted to Christianity looked at my dad straight in the face and said, the Jew died on the cross. And there's so many stories in my book. I, I retell the story uh, right at the beginning of my book about being at a Christian college and wearing a kippah uh, and, and people trying to share the gospel with me because they were convinced based on what they saw that I probably didn't know Jesus. And there's this upside down, topsy turvy world we live in where the question of the disciples, the early Jewish disciples of Yeshua, was how can someone be a Gentile and follow Yeshua? To now, in 2021, where the whole world is convinced that someone cannot be Jewish and follow Jesus. It's why Romans 1.16 is so important for us at our community. For I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or the Gentile. And we are unashamed. And we're living in a world where people are understanding that Jewish people can practice Judaism, should, even, I would say, from our perspective, are obligated to follow the covenants that God made with our fathers, which includes the new covenant, which is made first with the Jewish people and then extended to everyone who calls on the name 
of Yeshua. I, I shared this quote. It's in my book. I shared it in the first message of this series, but it's particularly poignant, poignant for this week message as well. Abraham Poyak was a, a Hebrew Christian, what we called ourselves before we came up with the term Messianic Jews. And in 1938, he, he wrote a book called The Cross and the Star of David. And this is right before the Holocaust. And of course, the world changes with the events of the Holocaust. Um, but this is what Abram Poyak says. Never has the Jewish people been so near to the idea of the kingship of Jesus. But we not, must not demand too much at once. The Jewish people as a whole will not at once accept Jesus as their Messiah, but they will first cease to condemn him. Then they will begin to think about him, recognize him as their brother, their teacher, and at last acknowledge him as a prophet and the Jew who is the central figure. But the dilemma is, Jesus is presented as a foreigner with a foreign message for a foreign people instead of what he actually is, which is Yeshua, the king of the Jewish people, the God of Israel, the Messiah first for the Jewish people and also for the Gentile. And, and there's, there's this dilemma in this world, both in the believing body of Messiah among Christians uh, and the Jewish people who reject Yeshua as the Messiah, and really the whole world are, are still blind to the Jewish identity of Jesus. It reminds me actually of the story which I talk about in my book, Jesus Never Said Anything New, as well in, in, in the book of Genesis, where Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, becomes the second in command of Egypt and saves the entire world, including his brothers, and in the process, reveals himself to his brothers. Genesis 42 and verse 8 says this, Though Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And similarly, what I want to help you understand through telling you the story of Joseph, who, who prefigures Yeshua in all kinds of ways, theologically and emotionally and spiritually, uh, Yeshua recognizes his own people, the Jewish people, but we can't recognize him because of the way he's been presented. I, I said in the first message that the greatest single cause of Jewish rejection of Jesus is Christians who turn Jesus into another God of another people and creator of another religion. But it hurts the truth of who Jesus really is when he's presented that way. So if we look at the story of Joseph in the, in the latter part of Genesis, uh, Joseph, we know, uh, if you read the whole story, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was 30 years old when he became second to Pharaoh in Egypt. And all through his story, after he sold into slavery, this, the Torah says over and over again, and Adonai was with him. God was with him in all of these difficult things he suffered. In his late... 30s or early 40s is when he reveals himself to his brother. And by this point, he is the second in command of Egypt, which is the most important world power in the world at this time. And there's a famine everywhere. And because of dreams that Joseph had, they stored up food so that everyone from everywhere comes to Egypt to get food to survive. And among the people who come are the brothers, well, 10 of the brothers of Joseph. But you have to get in your mind the, the scene. These 10 brothers who sold their brother into slavery years before and have still been working with the guilt and the pain and the struggle of selling their brother into slavery and lying to their father and telling him his son is dead, approach this man, probably sitting on a throne, wearing an Egyptian headdress and wearing the makeup that Egyptians would wear. And he <laughs> walked like an Egyptian and talked like an Egyptian. The story tells us that they bowed down to him as it, they worshipped him, as everyone who approached one who represented the Pharaoh would do. And the scriptures tell us in Genesis that he spoke through a translator, meaning he recognizes his brothers and remembers how to speak Hebrew. But he doesn't speak to them in Hebrew. He speaks to them in the language of Egypt, and the translator translates what he says into Hebrew and translates their Hebrew back to him, even though he understands every word. 
He at one point he invites them all to eat at, at a table, but but Genesis forty three uh, verse thirty two tells us that they ate separately because it was an abomination for an Egypt to e- Egyptian to eat with a Hebrew, even though Joseph is a Hebrew under all of this Egyptian garb. He he sits his brothers at the table in birth order without any question. And he convinces them several times. He convinces them that he can. He knows things about them because he does divination. And the spirits have revealed to him these things about them. And so they are desperately afraid of this man. And they have no indication that he's one of them, that he's their brother. They have no indication that, that uh, he is who he really is under this cultural uh look and different uh ethnicity that he even seems to be in that moment and in the story judah the oldest brother joseph's oldest brother and the oldest of the sons of jacob is the one who suggests back when they sold joseph into slavery is the one who said you know what instead of killing him guys why don't we just sell him into slavery and so you can imagine that Joseph was particularly bitter towards Judah. And it's Judah who steps forward and pleads for their youngest brother, Benjamin's life. And he mentions Joseph in his speech as the brother who died. And Joseph loses his composure. It's in Genesis 45 and verse 1, it says, Now Joseph could no longer restrain himself in front of all those who were standing by him. So he cried out, Get everyone away from me! So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. But he gave his voice to weeping so that the Egyptians heard and Pharaoh's household heard. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers were unable to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, the one you sold to Egypt. Could you imagine? They believe this guy's a magician. They believe that he knows things about him. He seems to know about their father and their brother. And he knew what order to seat them in by their age. And he knew that their brother apparently had one of his cups in a bag and that they had stolen from him. And he knew all of these things and he held their life in his hands. And all of the sudden, when when he says the words, get everyone away from me, he says that in the language of Egypt to all of the Egyptians. And it says all of the Egyptians left the room and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he says, Ani Yosef. It's me, Joseph. And they're looking at this person with the makeup on his eyes and the Egyptian headdress and all of the things of Egypt and the scepter in his hand and the throne that he's sitting on and he starts speaking in Hebrew. Ani Yosef, it's me, Joseph, is my father really alive? I'm, I'm the one you sold into slavery, remember? And they're so afraid, and they've been afraid all of this time, that there's this shock and awe to, what? Like, maybe this is magic. Maybe because he does divination, could he just switch to Hebrew and maybe... How does he know about Joseph? But he's saying them the words in Hebrew and he's speaking to them with no one else present of all of the Egyptian uh, like people and advisors and and that that sit around the, the, the throne of the one in charge. They have all left the room and it's just them and they're afraid that he's going to kill them. And he looks at them under all of this covering of being an Egyptian. He speaks to them in Hebrew. He says, come near to me, verse 4. And you have to ask the question, why does he want them to come close to him? And though it doesn't say explicitly in the text, there's the the Jewish people, the the sons uh, of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, had a very specific cut made of circumcision 
and though some of the cultures around them had similar like there's a form of circumcision in Egypt but it's not a good thing and it's not the same and i and i believe that when joseph says come close to me he shows them his circumcision because it's proof that he is who he just said he is it's me it's Joseph. I know in our culture, this circumcision and all of these things sound weird, but, but I need you to understand it, in that moment, the only proof that he had, it's like legal paperwork. It, it's like his birth certificate. It, it's, like, it's like something he presents to say, this is a certificate of authenticity that I really am who I say I am. So as they came close to him, he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother who sold you you sold into Egypt. And it seems, if you read the narrative, it seems like in this story that Joseph is ready to ditch all of his brothers. He doesn't care what happens to any of them except for Benjamin. And his whole plan is to keep Benjamin. But when Judah stands in front of him in the act of repentance and says, we've already lost our other brother. Please don't take this brother from us. If you take this brother from us, our father will die your father will die. And so Joseph says in verse 5, don't be grieved. Don't be angry in your own eyes that you sold me, since it was for preserving life that God sent me here before you. For there have been two years of famine in the land, and there will be five more, yet no plowing or harvesting. Remember, I have dreams. You guys remember that? I told you it was going to happen. I had more dreams while I was here. But God sent me ahead of you, verse 7, to ensure a remnant in the land and keep you alive for a great escape. So now it wasn't you. You didn't send me here, but God did. And he made me as a father to Pharaoh, lord over his whole house, and ruler over the entire land of Egypt. I just so hard to get into this moment and the emotions that go around Joseph and his brothers for him to say with all the bitterness that he had carried that he would get rid of all of his brothers and just keep Benjamin but in that moment he said to them you know what you didn't even send me here it was God Yeshua as a Jewish man stands in front of his own people my people the Jewish people he says to us I am Yeshua, your brother. My father sent me for you. And I'm a fulfillment of all the hopes of Israel. Come near to me and see that I'm one of you. See my circumcision and my scars on my hand, my feet and my side. People have blamed you for killing me, called you cursed, replaced and rejected. But I keep the covenants I made with your fathers. And it wasn't you that killed me. I offered myself as a sacrifice on Passover to rescue you from slavery to sin and death, and I have called you to tell the nations about me. See, my Father has made me Lord of all creation, and I was there when everything was made, and I have come for you, my people, so that you might recognize who I am, and so my brothers might worship me the same way Joseph's brothers worshipped him. I know all the pain. I was there in the Holocaust, and I was there in the pogroms, and I was there every time the Jewish people were kicked out of a country in my name. I was there, and I'm here now, and I'm speaking in the language of my people. I am one of you, and I have come to save you. That's the real heart of our Messiah, Yeshua. He came first for the Jewish people, and also for the nations, but we have to tear away all of the images that he's been made into and put into our minds that not only does he look Jewish, speak Hebrew, he's the fulfillment of the hope of all of Israel that we've always had back to our father, Abraham. 
the story of Joseph continues and after the shock and the awe in, in Genesis 45 and verse 14, it says, Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and he wept upon them. And finally, after this, his brothers talked with him, <laughs> which means they were in such shock and awe of is this even real and possible that it took them several minutes to even talk to him in my prayer as we talk about jesus who never said anything new and we talk about yeshua the one who came to fulfill all the hopes of the jewish people so that we the jewish people could do what we are called to do by god even before the times of yeshua to be a light to the nations and to tell the whole world that there's no other God but the God of Israel. And that the visible image of the God of Israel is the person of Yeshua. And my prayer is that my people, the Jewish people, and if you're Jewish and watching and not a follower of Yeshua yet, that we would fall on the neck of Yeshua and weep with joy that he came to save us. And that we would live up to the call to tell the nations that there's no God but the God of Israel and the person of you, Yeshua. And may we all, Jew and Gentile alike, see and understand Yeshua in his Jewishness so we with great joy can see the salvation of the whole world as we try to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. We want people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue to understand him in his context so our relationship with him can go deeper and we can understand who we are as we understand who he is, not just who he was, but who he still is. I'm so excited that my book is finished and out there and that so many people uh, are, are interacting with it. And I, I received um, a, a message from a good friend um, who is a Jewish believer and part of uh, a church and part of a small group in a church. And she decided to buy my book for several of the people in her small group. And she sent me this message that her friend sent to her, who's Jewish and a follower of Yeshua, but has not really understood Messianic Judaism yet. And she said, to my friend. I love this book you gave us. For me as a quote messianic, or at least becoming one, his writing is so clear to me and answering some tough questions with practicality. Thank you, this is not just a book, but a great gift. And then someone else uh, said to her, I was eating my lunch and paging through this book and chapter five, Stop Sinning, which is called Stop Sinning, feels a little, a little bit of a God nod considering our discussion this morning. And I saw this, this line in, in, in Matt's book, we, we don't obey to be blessed, we obey to be a blessing. We don't obey to be protected, we obey to protect. And I thought those were powerful and moving and I just wanted to share it. And I keep, it's so amazing to, to, uh, to receive messages like that. And it's such a joy. And actually next week, we're gonna continue this series in a message called Stop Sinning based on that same uh, on chapter five of my book where Yeshua heals a man on Shabbat and shows us what it means really live for God. And what obedience means for both Jews and for Gentiles. And, and I hope you'll join us next week. I love you, Restoration, those who are part of Restoration, I love you so much. Uh, we had such an incredible uh, event, time seeing each other last week for the celebration of Purim. We're gonna celebrate again together on March 27th, right before Passover starts, uh, here in Seattle, in live and in person. Uh, and we're praying for opportunity for us to have more events uh, together. And our Passover Seder is gonna be available on March 27th online, on our app and on YouTube, so that anybody can use it um, for the celebration of Passover. Uh, God is doing incredible things in this season. And for a small congregation in Seattle that has not met for a year, 
God is still doing miraculous and amazing things more than we could ever hope or imagine. I love you guys. I'm so proud to be the rabbi and honored to be the rabbi of this community as we follow our rabbi, Yeshua, together. See you next week.